Several weeks ago, I ran into one of our young mothers. And uh, she said, Pastor, do you have just a moment? And I said, certainly, what's the, the question? What is there a problem? Here's what she said. She said, you know, I try and try, but I just can't seem to get hold of the Spirit. It's so frustrating. And I asked her, have you ever seen the little uh, Holy Spirit booklet? And she said, no. And the title of it is, Have You Made the Wonderful Discovery of the Spirit-Filled Life? And so I share, well, listen, uh, before we talk about this, I want to give you, in fact, come on with me. We walked up the office. I gave her the little booklet that explains this little pamphlet. And I saw her a week later, and I said, well, how are you doing? She said, here were her words. She says, it's all the difference in the world. And just a radiant look on her face. And the conclusion of the matter is, the issue isn't, how do I get hold of the Holy Spirit? It's realizing the Holy Spirit has hold of you, is what the question is. That God's Spirit dwells in every one of us who has received Him, accepted Him as our Lord and Savior. And Satan does everything he can to confuse us about the Spirit's working and makes us move back to a try to salvation. But once we understand these basic little rules written by Dr. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, a dear friend of mine who's spoken in our church, once we understand this, Everything comes in focus. One of our problems in the world we live in today is that we have a commingled gospel. We have some of God's idea, some of our idea, and some of the world's idea in how we follow him, and that's the source of confusion. As uh, all of you know, I have three granddaughters and three grandsons, and my uh, middle grandson is in Awanas. And he came home thrilled about learning his scripture, and they're also learning the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And so uh, Daddy Kevin was asking him one day, he says, well, Lannon, quote that verse, John 3, 16, and here's how it came out. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Well, he's not here today because I wouldn't want to embarrass him. Uh, but we laugh at that. But if I ask you to tell me how the Holy Spirit works in your life, I'm afraid it would sound just like that. And we would all laugh at one another a little bit. How do you listen to God? Would you jot that down a moment? How do you listen to God? Three ways we listen to God. First of all, by experience. Secondly, by knowledge. And third, by brokenness. If you want the Lord Jesus to speak to you about anything going on to your life, you need to think through my experience, my knowledge of the Word, and my brokenness before Him, because that's how we hear Him. And the greatest thing that can happen to us on earth is to hear God in the moment. That's what it's all about. As you walk out these doors, as you drive home, as you go to work tomorrow, as you're sitting there at your desk, as you're taking care of the kids, whatever your problems or vicissitudes of your life might be this week, the most thrilling thing, even if you're sick and in a hospital bed or facing whatever you're facing, Lord, be present to me in the moment. We've talked about that so many times. It's God in the moment. There is no past. There is no future. No past to make us guilty. No future to make us fearful. If our Father is with us in the moment, we live. And hearing his voice and knowing that presence is what the Christian life is all about. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I do only what my hear my father tell me what to do. He had no guilt over the past. He had no fear over the future. And so if you and I want to learn to listen in the minutes, then grow in your experience. Don't worry when you blunder and make mistakes. Have a knowledge of the Word of God. This is our great uh, difficulty. We just don't know the book. And be broken in your spirit. Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Reveal to me what I am. Let me see me the way you see me, and I'll come to you in brokenness and desperation. That's where I need to be in my Christian life. And you say, well, why are minutes so important? May I remind you again 
of one of the most beautiful stories I've ever heard of a little girl asking daddy, daddy, could we live a whole year without sinning? No, darling, could we live a whole month without sinning? No, darling, could we live a whole day without sinning? No, darling, could we live an hour without sinning? No, darling, well, daddy, could we live one minute without sinning? And the father told his little daughter, well, maybe we could live one minute without sinning. And she said, then why don't we live our lives in minutes? Some of you have heard me say that before. Most of you have forgotten it, so I'll say it again because it's so critical to the basics of the Christian life. Walk in the Spirit, Paul tells the Romans in chapter 8, and you shall not gratify the lust or the evil desires of the flesh. And you walk step by step, minute by minute. Now, if I can uh, show you here just briefly on the screen... Uh, what we want to see. This was the booklet last week that we used. And remember I said there's the natural person. Here he is. Here's the throne of his life right here in the middle. Everyone has a throne. And the natural man, look at all the dots. See how the dots are misarranged and all some things are out of proportion. Too much time at business, too little time with the children. None of us can get it together as long as we're on the throne of the life. And here you see the, the self on the throne of the life, I'm going to do what I want to do. Remember the Lord's words in Luke 9, 23 and 24. He says, except a man take up his cross daily and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it, but he who finds himself for his own sake shall lose it. Now, what the Lord Jesus is saying there, if you live for your own agenda, you'll lose your life. But if you live for my agenda, you'll find out who you are. One of the basic things we as Christians need to understand is that we do not exist for ourselves. And our whole culture is filled with it. Everywhere you look, everything you read, everything you see, everything you hear, wherever it is, in the music and on the, on the boob tube and in the radio and on the newspapers and in the commentators, all the rest, it's me, 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 me. And that's why we're so miserable. We exist for him. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, he that gives his life, soul, body, spirit to my agenda will find what I created him to be. But the self-life never makes it because we enthrone ourselves. Now, the spiritual person, notice, everything is in order. Now, that goes back and forwards. I can't get into that. I'm going to talk later on the grace-truth line about how we oscillate around truth. None of us are like Jesus. Jesus never deviated from grace and truth. He was a straight line right to the Father. You and I deviate back and forth, and God has to correct us. But in those moments, we cross that grace-truth line. Grace means perfect action. Truth means perfect knowledge. And there are times we're all there. Every one of us here today could hold our hands up and say, yes, I remember that moment when I was everything I could be to him and I tasted for the first time all he wanted to be to me. And it was wonderful. Oh, that I could have more and more moments like that, see. But anyway, those moments are here. The Christ-directed life, Christ is on the throne, the cross is there on the throne, and the self is still there. It's still you. It's still H.D. McCarty. But it's Christ leading me to do what he wants me to do. Now, the problem, I'll move over here. Here's the self-directed life. You see, this life, the Christian, who still leaves himself in the throne, has the same kind of life as those who are not Christians. The reason most people in the church even though they are saved and know Christ, look just like the pagans, the best pagans in the community, is that the self is still on the throne. You're still running your life. Christ is there, and we come under conviction, but as long as we're still in the throne, the balance of our life will be all messed up. And so, what's the key? Lord Jesus, I want you to be in the throne of my life. I remember Dennis Rainey, one of our former staff members who now directs a national family ministry, has been on Dobson, testified before Congress and all the rest, always used to ask my son Kevin, the first thing he'd ever ask him, he said, Kev, who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? Be a good question today, wouldn't it, Pastor Brown? Just start right over here. 
Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne of your life today? Is it really Christ? How many of you here feel like you're a blunder? I think all of us would. In fact, someone asked me one time, if you ever write a book, what will it be on? I told them, blundering in grace. <laughs> How we blunder. And God says, I have forgiven you all those blunders, past, present, and wait, future. Mothers, when you had that little boy or that little girl, in your heart was the attitude, whatever mistakes they make, I'm going to forgive them and cover it up in love, right? Well, that's the way the Father looks on us. Once I realize that all my sins in the future are already forgiven, now if, I don't, if I rebel against the Lord and I continue to commit them, I'm going to pay a price down here. I'm going to reap the result of that sin, but they're already forgiven. Satan tries to tell you they're not and puts you in a work environment and you work at it and you feel more and more guilty about it. God doesn't want you feeling guilty unless you are. And if you are, he knows how to get rid of it because the sin's already forgiven if you'll come to it. And most of us just don't have that straight. And Satan comes accusing us continually. Well, look, how do we do it? Look at the top one on your worship guide. We are filled with the Holy Spirit by faith that's just a faith act, a trust act. We do that all the time. You say, well, faith is a big word. I don't understand. Why? You have faith when you turn the key in your car, get ready to go home. The engine will start, don't you? You have faith if you eat food and it goes down in your stomach that somehow something's been created down there that's going to take care of that food. Don't you have the faith to do that? You just do it. And when the Word of God says something here, do it. In fact, uh, I don't know if we have much time for this. I'm going to take a moment. We do not realize how many comments we make, how many words we use, how many phrases we use that are non-biblical, and they preach against what the Bible teaches, and we don't even know it. I've listed a few here. One of them is, well, I'm trying. Where do you find that in here? Try to take up your cross. Try to control your mind. Try to tithe. Try to go to church on Sunday. The word trying is not in the Bible because you don't have to try. God has already given us the Holy Spirit, and if we will to obey, we can do it. Boy, you say, that's foreign to me. It's foreign to you because your experience in listening, your knowledge of the Word, and your brokenness before God is lacking. Get those three things in line, and you'll begin to hear the Lord in it. Here's another one. Well, uh, how about seeing you Tuesday? No, Tuesday's a bad day. Well, what made Tuesday a bad day? Well, my schedule made Tuesday a bad day. How come God gives you the power by your schedule to make his day bad? I mean, there's a good question for you. There aren't any bad days. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Here's another one. Well, time heals everything. I have news for you. No, it doesn't. What you think is time healing is just your brain getting duller. <laughs> you just can't remember. Time doesn't heal a thing. Truth heals things. So sometimes we think time might do it. Here's another one. Oh, I just don't have time. You and I have time to do everything that God has told us to do. We can't do everything, but we can do everything God wants us to do. A great insight. Here's just uh, one more. Uh, I can't do it. No, you can't, but God can. That's a part of the Christian life. He's always giving us the impossible things to do. So here it is. Look back, if you would, in the worship guide here. We are filled with the Holy Spirit by faith. Then we can experience the abundant and fruitful life that Christ promised. Just do what he tells you to do. We'll look at those in just a moment. Now then, here are the steps. You can appropriate the filling of the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit as you walk out the door here in just a few minutes and start a new life in Christ. You say, well, what if I sin again? So what? You get filled again. In fact, if you'd like to turn over to the text, and I want to share something with you, John 14. It's a beautiful truth. John chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 15. 
And see, we have this idea that we are strong enough in our own energy to keep from doing what we shouldn't. And we're not because we all are going to blunder. We're going to make mistakes. We're like little babies. You don't expect an eight-month-old baby to run. He's going to fall. And uh, as he falls, he's going to look a little foolish, but he's going to get up and try again. That's why the Bible says we grow as little children in Christ. We're all going to make a lot of mistakes. And I've shared with you our sins fall in four categories. There are the mistakes we make as children, as little babies. We just don't know any better. There are the besetting sins that we struggle with that others don't. There's satanic deception. Satan, smarter than any of us here, can deceive us. And then there's sins of rebellion. And most of our sins are in those first three areas, the sins of babyhood, the sins of weakness, and the sins of deception. And we have to grow in Christ in our experience and in our knowledge of the Word and in our brokenness to where we're able to overcome those things. Now look in John 14, 15. Jesus, our Master, said, If you love me, you will obey whatever I command. And most of us just fall on our face and say, Oh, good night, I haven't obeyed what he's commanded. Well, look, you not only obey to not do wrong, you also obey when you've done wrong. John, the same author who wrote this over in his first of the letter, 1 John said, the man that says he is not a sinner is a liar. Now, none of us want to sin this week, but I'll take a bet with any of you that we're all going to. Some of us big, some of us maybe little. It's all of us in ways we don't even know. So when we sin, because we're part of a fallen world, we have a fallen nature, the Holy Spirit's remaking that nature, and it will not be totally remade until we're before Christ, hallelujah, we are going to struggle with sin. That's why the writer of Hebrews said, you have not yet resisted the shedding of your blood, your struggle against temptation. The older I get in Christ, the more I realize how difficult and excruciating and painful and tough it is to live a pure life. Many of you younger folks say, well, when I'm 30 or 40, the battle will be over. <laughs> Listen, it's only as we grow in Christ that we realize the intense agony and battle it is to live purely before the Lord. And we're all going to fail. And Satan, if you listen to him and don't have the Spirit speaking to you, you're not listening to God, he's going to tell you you're wrong, you've blown it, you're no good, you failed again, you can't do that, give up, you're not any use. And the Lord says here, if you love me, obey what I command. One of the things he commanded us was to obey him when we sin and confess it and come back and start over again. See, God calls us to come back. And we come back by obeying. Now, notice what it says here. You can appropriate the feeling, one, by sincerely desire to be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you really want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit today? Number two, confess your sins by faith. Thank God he's forgiven you all of your sins. Notice the next one. Present every area of your life to God. And that's what Jeff wants to do. That's why that's exciting. That's what I want to do. And then by faith, claim the fullness of the Holy Spirit according to his command. Be filled with the Spirit. See, God never commands anything that he doesn't promise he'll do. God has commanded every one of us to be filled with the Spirit. And if he's commanded it, he expects you to do it, not try. And if you say, Lord, I yield to you right now, come into my life, he'll do it. And you do that minute by minute by minute by minute. Look at the text again. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you'll obey me when you win, you'll obey me when you fail, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. Now, that word counselor is parakaleo, and he says another counselor. Jesus said, I'm going away, so I'm going to leave the counselor, the Holy Spirit within you. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you incredible thing the gospel teaching is that the Holy Spirit is in you you don't get this by reason you get it by revelation because if you have asked Christ to come into your life his spirit dwells in you I knew that the moment I prayed with Bert Holstein to ask Christ to come into my life I was just a dumb filthy mouth high school kid and he said if you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life he'll do it and I can remember kneeling there in mother's old pink uh, love seat 3517 Haney. 
Dallas, Texas, a couple of blocks off the SMU campus. And I even forget exactly what I said. Something like, Lord, I need you. Forgive me. Come into my life. Something happened. Little did I dream of where that one decision would lead me. And it's happened to me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Whenever I stop and say again, as I said at the first, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I want to follow you. Forgive me of my sin. Even forgive me of not wanting to be forgiven. <laughs> How about that one? Well, some of us are so cold and so stiff-necked and hard-hearted that we don't get broken before God. You'd better get broken. God's seeing to it that it's happening. And Jesus says, but you know me, for he, li he who lives with you and will be in you. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. I will not leave you an orphan. I'm going to use this verse next week and have a great illustration on that. But I will come to you. Before the long, the world will see me not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Now, what does that mean? Jesus Christ says, because I'm alive to you, you're alive to God. Now, it's wonderful to have someone alive to you. My youngest little grandson, Hayden, Hayden Dwight McCarty, little HD. Shirley says, don't call him HD, call him Hayden. But I kind of like to think of him. There's a little HD, bless his heart. Uh, but Shirley tells me whenever I go in the room and I talk to Landon or I talk to Kevin or I talk to Laura and I don't talk to him right away, he looks at me and has a little desperate look on his face until Poppy speaks to him. But the second Poppy speaks, the smiles come or he turns and runs anything to get my attention because my attention makes him live. See? It doesn't just work that way, it works the other way too. Because if I see him today after the service, and because he's alive to me, I'm alive. And every one of you mothers and you daddies out there know exactly what I'm talking about have that precious little life alive to you. Mothers, remember the first time you leaned over the crib and said something, there's my little man or there's my big girl, and that little baby smiled at you for the first time. You thought Einstein had rewritten the theory of relativity by what happened because it was so wonderful, see? And I tell you, my dear friends, if we practice the presence of God, if we listen to the Spirit, we know what it means for Christ to be alive to us. And then I'm alive. See, that's his promise. Way back in 1960s when I became your pastor, I shared this verse with you. Look at verse 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me will be loved of my Father, and I too will love him. And the Greek there is very clear. I will make myself real to him. Now, my dear friend, the most desperate need you have in your life and that I have in mine is for Jesus Christ to be real to you. And if I could have asked one thing for this sermon, I would have talked to the Lord and I said, Father, at the end of this sermon, if you'll put in an appearance, send your son, it's all I'll ever ask. And I would be able to stop and look over at the door here and Jesus Christ would walk through the door and stand right here. And if he came in and stood right there and looked at every one of us, we would all be on the edge of our seats wondering what the message would be, you know what it would be. He'd say, I love you, love me, do what I've told you, and leave. See? I pray for you and for me that we yield to the Spirit. Pray through this prayer. Ask Him into your life. Walk minute by minute. When you blow it, come right back. Because there's no power on earth than to know that Jesus Christ is real to you. See? Nothing else will stabilize you. Nothing else will sustain you 
in this fallen world.